Good morning, everyone. This is a great group. I'm so excited. My name is Lauren Silver, and I am the Vice President of Education at the Commonwealth Club of California. And I am so happy to see everybody here, and it's a, just a privilege to welcome you here today. Our program this morning is a special collaboration between the Commonwealth Club's Civics Education Initiative called Creating Citizens and the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. And for those of you who don't know the Commonwealth Club, we're the oldest and largest nonpartisan public affairs forum in the US. We're located in San Francisco. We were founded in 1903. Every year we host hundreds of programs with leaders and influencers in conversation about diverse topics from education to politics, climate to social justice, entertainment, culture, and more. And Creating Citizens is the Commonwealth Club's civics education initiative, which engages youth and adults in meaningful civil dialogue about the issues of our day so that we can all be active, informed participants in our shared democracy. So we're grateful to the Corette Foundation for their generous support of Creating Citizens and for their dedication to improving the quality of civics education in California and beyond. So a couple of housekeeping items to keep in mind before we start. We're recording this program for video and audio, which means that you'll be able to watch it or to, and listen to it again or to share it with other people if they haven't been able to come here today. It also means that the sounds of cell phones and watches and other devices can be heard. So yep, you guys are, are already predicting what I'm gonna say. If you could please silence your devices, that would be great. We're gonna have time for questions and answers later in the program. So please think about what you might wanna ask the speakers today. We'll let you know when it's time for questions and we will be passing around a microphone, or two microphones actually, so that you can ask questions of the speakers. We're gonna appreciate, please, you're keeping masks on at all times while you're in this room upstairs, except when you're asking a question. You can take a mask off for that. So, since 1931, the Commonwealth Club has been home of the California Book Awards, which honors the extraordinary creativity and diversity of California writers. Every year, the jury reads hundreds of submissions and selects the most outstanding books for recognition. I have the privilege of serving on the jury, and I can tell you with all confidence that the book we're here to discuss today, Seen and Unseen, which many of you have in your laps already, was which won the 2023 gold medal for juvenile literature, was honestly one of the best books we read in any category all year. It was also honored with a Robert F. Seibert medal as the most distinguished informational book for children by the American Library Association. And as you know, its author, Elizabeth Partridge, is with us today. Our moderator for the conversation with Elizabeth is Yuki Nishimura. Yuki is a manager in the Silicon Valley Human Rights Watch Development Office. She regularly volunteers with the San Francisco and San Jose Japantown community and serves on several boards, including the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. She rece received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto and a Master's of Arts in Human Rights from Columbia University. I know this is gonna be a rich and rewarding conversation today, so without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Yuki Nishimura, who will introduce our special guest, Elizabeth Partridge. Thank you. We'll first take our seats and oh my goodness, seeing this room today, it's just very exciting. And I wanna take a moment, Lauren, thank you so much for the very kind intro today and to Creating Citizens, the Commonwealth Club, as well as my beloved Japanese American Museum of San Jose for co-hosting today's program. 
My name is Yuki Nishimura, and I am incredibly honored to have this opportunity to moderate today's conversation with Elizabeth. Now, before I dive into today's program, I actually wanted to take a moment to really recognize how extremely packed this room is and how exciting that truly is for our museum. And each and every one of you, I know you chose to come here on a Saturday morning <laughs> to a museum, and so that, above all, is a huge commitment. So thank you, everyone here. Arigatou gozaimasu. Now, I actually want to take a moment and say, is there anybody here today who is here for the first time at the museum? Please raise your hand. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. This is great to see. And anybody here for the maybe second time? Second time? Because what I see with the second timers is that you love the museum and you're also back because Elizabeth is here and that is very special to us as well. So thank you so much. And a special welcome to everybody here today because you are here at one of my absolute favorite places. And I know that sounds like an, a big statement to make here, but it is truly what I feel in this moment. This museum is where I began my real education into what happened during World War II and what happened to the Japanese Americans. This is a part of history that so oftentimes is not correctly and fully explained in our public school systems as well as our private school systems. Now, I was born in Japan and I was raised there until I was five. And I came to the Bay Area and I was actually uh, raised in Palo Alto and Menlo Park, and I went through the public education system from first grade all the way to 12th grade. And I do remember that there was small paragraphs in my textbook explaining, explaining what the Japanese American incarceration was like. But that was not enough. It was here when I came here in 2019 that I began to really learn. And I'm still in that process of learning. Today is just that lesson for me as well. And so this space is an incredibly important space for me. And I'm so grateful to be able to share this with all of you here today. Now, we have an incredibly special guest, Elizabeth Partridge, here with us today. And I want to take a little moment to, uh, to share with you a little bit about her. Now, some of you like, you, uh, like Lauren mentioned, have this book with you already, but Seen and Unseen, with Dorothy Lang, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel Adams' photographs reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. This is Elizabeth's newest book, and I believe you have authored already 17 other books in addition to this, so quite a prolific writer. And she has been recognized by the National Book Award finalist, a Boston Globe Horn Book Award, an LA Times Book Prize, American Library Association Michael L. Prince Honor, and the Jane Addams Children's Book Award. Elizabeth is the goddaughter of Dorothea Lange, and she grew up surrounded by her beautiful photographs, including this one that you see here. Now, I, I know that in fifth grade, you had heard one of your classmates, who is actually here today, from Paul Yonemura, who um, spoke about the Japanese-American incarceration during your class, and that was when you first heard really mm -hmm. about this. And that began kind of your journey into learning more about what happened. And I know that this photograph here was uh, taken by Dorothy Lang, and it pictures Torazo Sakawe with carrying his young grandson on his shoulders down a dusty Manzanar street. And that's really what inspired Elizabeth to write this book. This photograph sat, and I believe, in your office. Mm -hmm. And I remember you wrote that it kind of spoke to you. It called to you and asked, when are you going to tell our story? And that is how this beautiful book came to be. So without further ado, please welcome Elizabeth. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we will be going through um, some several questions and answers between us, and then we will open it up for the audience as well. And 
I knew we had some questions prepared, but I actually wanted to start with one question that I know I hadn't given to you beforehand, but it is, you know, your title is Seen and Unseen. Mm -hmm. And so I know I just shared some bios about you, but could you share something that maybe none of the audience members here know about yourself, something a little bit unseen about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> That's a surprise question. Um, you know, I think I would say I actually try to look like a very ordinary person that you would just walk by on the street. But I come from this family of photographers where my godmother was a photographer, Dorothea, and my grandmother, Imogen Cunningham, was a photographer. My dad was Imogen's son, Rondell Partridge. He was a photographer. So I'm actually always walking around, and in my mind, I'm taking photos because that is how I've been trained to see the world. And it's actually a wonderful thing to do because you will see so much beauty and also so many things that if you just pause for a sec to notice, you'll see some amazing things. So yeah, I have, an, I have an internal camera for my eyes only. We love that minds photograph, I guess, that you're taking catalog of. And thank you so much for sharing. I know I threw that curveball at you in the very beginning. <laughs> But I think all of us here are really excited to learn more about your process with the book. But the first question I wanted to start off with is, what inspired you to write mm. this children's book about Japanese American incarceration during World War II? And why did you choose Dorothea Lange, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel Adams as your focal point? Mm -hmm. So um, this photo was Dorothea Lange, right before she died, had a show that she prepared. She unfortunately died before the show actually opened, but in um, uh, New York City at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. And this photo was a reject um, from the show, although they, they're, it's actually this print was a reject. There, there was this photo in the show. But, uh, Dorothea gave this print to my dad. And many years ago, my dad gave it to me. And so I, oh boy, I have to already warn you guys. I cry easily. <laughs> I will probably cry several times today. So um, this photo has sat on my wall of my office, my adult life. And um, I've always loved the contrast of the light on their faces mm -hmm. because the grandchild is so smooth and innocent of life left in, leaving marks on him yet. And yet the grandfather, so much life shows on his face. You just know he's had a super wonderful, amazing, difficult, amazing, hardworking life. And his, there's something about his eyes. I have always felt he's been saying to me, when will you tell our story? <laughs> because look, I mean, he's asking. He's like, you know how to do this. <laughs> will you please get to work? And I resisted for a long time because I knew it would be intense and that I would go way down the rabbit hole. Finally, I plunged in and started working on this book. And the reason that I knew, I mean, I had been around Dorothea and her photographs all my life. She lived in North Berkeley and I lived on the other side of town. Um, but in fifth grade, I became aware of the incarceration because my classmate, Paul Yanamoro, we just give a little wave so people can talk to you afterwards if they <laughs> want to ask you anything. Paul um, said in our class, you know, my family wasn't able to buy a house in this neighborhood after the war. And I was like, what? I, I just, uh, I also have a very strong audio memory despite being in a photographer's family. And that went into my brain and I was like, wow, what was going on in my beautiful, quiet neighborhood that people ganged up against other people? So that, that little bit sat there. Mm -hmm. And then along with these uh, beautiful faces, I was like, okay, got to write the book. Thank you so much for sharing. Can you share just a little bit about also your father's relationship with Dorothy? Yes. So my dad, so he grew up with his mother, Imogen Cunningham, decided at 17 he wanted to be a photographer. And so 
Imo sent him off to work with what were called family friends. First, he went to work with Ansel in the mountains. And he used to tell, this is Ansel Adams, for those of you who missed that reference. <laughs> he used to tell uh, funny stories about dragging Ansel's heavy equipment all, <laughs> all the way up to the top of these mountains. And he did take some very funny photographs of Ansel working up on the tops of those mountains. So he worked with Ansel for a while. Then he went to work with Dorothea. And he became her apprentice, and he drove her up and down the streets of, mm -hmm. and the back lanes of California and loaded her cameras. When they got back from a day of shooting, he would um, develop her film, make her prints. You know, he did everything. They bonded. And so he became like a son and yet not quite a son. And so instead of actually celebrating all our holidays with our biological family, we actually were melted into Dorothea's family. I see. Thank you so much. And what a, what a connection to have. And I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with this title, Seen and Unseen, particularly? And what is, to you, the importance of the unseen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Titles are very interesting when you write a book because it's not just one person who comes up with the title. Titles come in as you've been working on the book for a while. Everybody starts suggesting titles. The mm -hmm. editor, the writer, the illustrator, anybody who, oh, publicity, <laughs> anybody, <laughs> anybody who might have an idea. And um, we brainstormed for quite a while. And I believe it was Lauren who came up with the idea of seeing the illustrator. I believe she's the one who came up with the idea of what is seen in the image and what is unseen. Um, oh, actually, that's not true. It was my sister. Oh, I just remembered <laughs> who is a photographer. So she was like, what about scene? And I was like, ooh, love that. Um, we look at the incarceration in this book through three photographers' photographs. What are, what are we seeing that they saw? And what is unseen? What is out of the frame of the shot? What are they encouraging us to think about is going on versus what may actually be going on? And why is this so unseen? Why have we not honored what we did as a country and said we can never do this again? Why is this not publicly known? Why is it unseen? So all those layers were in there. Thank you so much for sharing. And can you, I know you earlier mentioned that this book required a lot of research. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear a little bit about that research process and like all the materials that you had to gather and things in that process. Could you mm -hmm. share with us a little bit about it? Okay, I love researching. I love researching. I'm definitely an archive rat. You know, <laughs> give me an assignment to go to a library and just stay there for days, and I'm very happy. So I did a lot of research with what has been written. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually a fair amount that has been written. Um, I also of course, looked at every photograph I could find by anybody of the whole incarceration. Um, I was not able to go to Manzanar, um, which I, I was sorry not to be able to do that, but I found ways to get myself back to that space um, as best I could. The other thing I loved doing was reading oral histories and then anyone I could find who was still alive that I could interview. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's nothing like an oral history. I was an acupuncturist for 20 years, and so I love sitting down with someone and say to them, please tell me your life story. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that is such an honor to be able to do that. So anyone I could find who could tell me their stories. And we were able to put lots of little quotes throughout the book, which was... I, I just love that. They're very, cause they're very emotional. And I know that with this book, you mentioned, um, and I, I have a friend who also is an author, and mm -hmm. she shared a little bit about her experience. And oftentimes, you know, the, the cover art and the arts that go inside the book, it's oftentimes out of your control. But right. this book was special and that you actually got to have a really collaborative um, spirit with Lauren Tamaki, who was the graphic designer for many of your um, 
the artworks in yes. it. And so could you share a little bit about Lauren and that sort yes. of collaborative process? Yes. OK, so yeah. What I did is I went to the Chronicle, to Ariel Richardson at Chronicle, and said, I would love to do this book. Um, I know about Dorothea Lange's photos. I know Ansel photographed the incarceration, but I don't know too much about his photos. But we would definitely need an illustrator to fill in, because I already knew we would be missing things from the photos. And she found Lauren Tamaki. And Lauren's just flat out a genius. I mean, she is an incredible illustrator. Mm -hmm. And so her images are in there. I, I mean, I, I never get over how astonishing her work is. She's able to be so emotional at so many levels. Um, she uses a motif throughout the book of the circle, the lens, the sun, the moon. Mm -hmm. She's just constantly using this beautiful image. This is a bus where people are being bused and the shades are down. Mm -hmm. And we have this quote, six-year-old Amy I Iwasaki thought that she, her family, and quote, all the Japanese Americans had done something so bad that the people didn't even want to look at us. You know, and that's, you combine this kind of beautiful artwork with a statement like that, and you understand some of the emotional cost mm -hmm. of this, let alone all the physical costs. So Lauren just plunged into this and just provided us with movement in the book, scenes that wouldn't be in the book, she was also turned out to be an archive rat, and so she just got all kinds of materials together to be able to make the incredible images that she did. And usually in kids' books, they keep the illustrator and the um, author far apart, but that was not possible with this book, and so the three of us just would, we would throw things around, like I might say like, uh, how do you like this quote? She'd be like, yeah, that's pretty good. And she's like, but this photo you chose, I think this one might be better. I'm like. Great, swap it out. So yeah, we had a blast. Wonderful, and actually, can you take a moment to explain for those who have not yet had a chance to read your novel mm -hmm. and your book, can you explain a little bit about the differences between the three photographers and what? Yes, yes, I would love yes. to, yes. So when I told the um, editor that I knew Dorothea's work very well, and I knew Ansel had photographed, but that Dorothea never thought too much of his man's in our work. Now, they were dear friends, very good friends. But she, what she said about Ansel was, I, I remember her saying this, he just didn't get it. <laughs> so I knew there was going to be a contrast there. Dorothea went for showing how, what a terrible, difficult thing this was. Mm -hmm. Ansel had a different agenda. What he wanted to show, now he came later, so first we have Dorothea's photos, then we have Toyo's in the middle, which I'll explain in a sec, and then we have Ansel's at the end, because he was towards the end of the incarceration that he photographed. Mm -hmm. He, in fairness to Ansel, he wanted to show that Japanese Americans were trying hard, being good citizens, or not yet citizens, and should be welcomed back into mainstream America. But he did that by showing people as cheerful and resilient and not having a problem with the hardships they had been putting up with for several years at that point. So I had that contrast going. The minute I started researching, I found Toyo Miyataki's photos. Toyo was a actually incredible pictorial pictorialist kind of photography. The whole Japanese sensibility to photos. There was a whole, Jap there were very powerful Japanese photo clubs in the 20s and 30s in the United States where they just explored these beautiful aesthetics. He did amazing work. And he made a living as a studio, running a, f a portrait studio, doing weddings and you know any kind of uh, celebration that people wanted. Um, 
memor mem memorialized. Um, so he was incarcerated and uh, brought in, put in a barrack with his family. And um, he was able to smuggle in a camera lens and a film holder into camp. Then his friends in Woodshop made him a camera, which, you know, that has to be light, like, you know, like no light can get in, right? If you're gonna make a camera, it has to be totally so that no one can, no light gets in. So he snuck around with this amazing camera. This is a replica of his camera that was built by his son. And uh, you can actually see this at the Japanese American Museum in uh, Los Angeles. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, look at this. She, I was like, you know, this is a very complicated process. She's like, give it to me, baby. And so she <laughs> drew out the whole thing. I mean, there's so much you can get to explore in just that one page. Like I said, she's a genius. So um, Toyo got to take photographs that no outsider would have been able to take. He was an insider. He knew what was going on. So he took these amazing photos that are um, very touching. Um, and then he was also eventually found out, mm -hmm. but not, he thought he was curtains, but nope, no, no, no. Uh, he was, they realized they needed a camp photographer. So he got to photograph and, and then ma they made yearbooks with his photos. But with great limitation too, right? He wasn't allowed to. Yes, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was allowed to take a photograph, like get it all set up and go to take it, but he was not allowed to click the shutter. Like he, like, like what? I mean, so he, they kept hiring these women whose husbands worked at the camp. They would hire these women to sit around until he said, okay, click my shutter. That, that's humiliating for a photographer. That is it's such a puny way of controlling people. Eventually, they let him click his own shutter. Now, I know that with Dorothea, she had a lot of limitations in what she was allowed to photograph. Yes. Um, quickly to share, she was not allowed to photograph the communal showers or bathrooms, no photographing the guard towers with their machine guns and searchlights, and no photographing the tall barbed wire fences surrounding the camps. Yet despite this, she kept trying to challenge within her photographs that sort of mm -hmm. what was going on. And so I'd love for you to read, I have the page ready for you. Okay. Page 48, if you do not mind, can you read for us mm -hmm. this page that you have written? Where did you want me to start? I'm here. Right here, this. okay. Whatever she photographed, Dorothea put layers of meaning, meaning in the image. A simple looking photograph of a grandfather and grandson seems to ask a question. Why had the United States government locked up a very old man and a toddler? How were they a threat to our national security? At night, Dorothea would lie in her bed, a sense of dread giving her a terrible stomach ache. Where was the United States headed, taking away people's rights like this? She was overwhelmed by the injustice. By early July, Dorothea's job was done. The government had the, photo had the photographs they wanted. Then I have a quote from Dorothea. All Dorothea could do was hope her photographs carried a strong message. This is what we did, she said. How did it happen? How could we? So that, that's how she made, the, she made the feeling arise in the viewer by looking at a, something that seems doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, why would these people be imprisoned? Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. that and for reading this. Now, I know we do have some younger audience members in mm -hmm. the room. 
And I wanted to ask you, what is it that you would like your young readers to take away from your novel? Mm -hmm. What is it that you would like people, anybody reading the novel, to take away? Uh, I think we do have to be honest about our history in the United States and not whitewash it and pretend things are better than they were because then you leave yourself vulnerable to doing it again. Mm -hmm. And we are in such a fraught time again. We have to defend our democracy. And not, I took democracy for granted, and I no longer do. I realize we have to be vigilant. And our younger generation is the group that will be like, wait a second. We need to stand strong, be clear with what we've done and what we want to do. Thank you so much. And I want to move to the last question between the two of us, and then we will open it up for the audience Q&A. Now, your book encourages critical thinking and discussion about social justice. How do you envision that teachers, parents, and young readers using your book as a starting point for conversations about these sorts of issues? Actually, there's a couple things I would love young people to do and that teachers can encourage. One, interview older people. Mm -hmm. Talk to them. There are so many stories. There are so many beautiful lives that are so rich. And you'll, you'll hear things you did not expect. So any teacher who can encourage um, some oral histories in their classroom would just make my day. The other thing is we have an incredibly powerful tool in our pockets. You know, can you imagine if Dorothea had like, oh, I think I'll just take a photo of that. You know, they had these heavy setups and they had to get going. Use, we've seen some of this, like videos and stuff where people use this to say like, no, this is what actually happened on the street that day. You know, be aware that you have a tool for social justice in your pocket and you can use it. You can use it for pollution. You can use it for civil rights. You can use it for all kinds of things. So, um, and to learn to document your world and see your world beyond cute mug shots of yourself in the mirror. <laughs> It's a challenge for teenagers, you know, because that's a time of looking at yourself. But to, to just like to take a photograph of your bedroom, that five years later, you'll be like, oh, God, mom was right. I should have cleaned up all those clothes off my floor <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah. Before we hop into questions from the audience, I want to um, just ask Yuki two quick questions. Oh, oh my. Yes, of course. Yuki did an incredible... Um, master's thesis that I, I read and was just totally taken with. Would you quickly tell them, because this is a part of history that even I didn't know too much about, so please tell them what your thesis was about. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's too kind, and um, I'll keep it short. I know it's a thesis, so I've had a lot of research similar to you. <laughs> I loved researching, and um, my thesis really focused on the Japanese Latin Americans and their stories. And this is a story that oftentimes is not told at all, and most people do not, have not heard about it. But uh, during World War II, 2,264 Japanese Latin Americans, people who were living in various countries in Latin America, were actually taken by the U.S. government, essentially kidnapped by the U.S. government. T their passports were taken, and they were put on the ship, shipped over to the U.S., and once they arrived, obviously, because their passports were taken away, they were deemed illegal aliens. And then they were placed in, in, in the uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice camps. Um, many of them were in Crystal City. Now, 80% of these people were Japanese Peruvians. And once the war ended, the, many of the uh, Latin American countries refused to allow them to come back to their countries. So a good majority of them had to go to war-torn Japan, or some of them were able to fight to stay in this country and ultimately got citizenship. 
but my thesis really looked at their story and their continued fight for reparations as well. Now, in that process, mm -hmm. I did a lot of oral history as well. I interviewed about 23 different people, and many of whom actually the museum helped me to connect with. And throughout that process, what I learned was exactly what you learned as well. There is so much knowledge that people have to share. And yet, I think sometimes in the fast pace of life, we forget to ask people, what is that story? What is your story? Please, I want to hear about it. And so, similar to you, I would love to encourage everybody here to go home, maybe think about that person who you haven't actually heard the story from, or maybe you think you have, mm -hmm. but maybe there's more to learn. There is that unseen portion still to be discovered. Now, thank you so much for that, mm -hmm. and <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. And you know, I, I wanted to see this book. <laughs> Yeah. Still a work in progress, I think. <laughs> but I'd love to open it up for audience Q&A. And we have microphones ready as well for anybody who may have questions. If you could raise your hand if you have any questions for Elizabeth. And please do not be shy to ask any question. And we do not expect you to have necessarily written, uh, sorry, written, read the book yet. And it's okay because you are about to. And so please go ahead, ask any question that you might have. And if you could say your name first too, oh, is that okay? I'm Yoshiko Kanazawa, and I was interned in Gila River when I was six and a half. But wow. um, I thought I read that Dorothea's photos were all confiscated by the mm -hmm. government at mm -hmm. one time. Mm -hmm. And then what? made them release those photos. Right. So, so the question is, like, were Dorothea Lange's photographs confiscated by the government? Some of them were. Not all of them. What happened is there was a guy named Major Beasley. And Major Beasley took a look. Dorothea had to take her photos to San Francisco and show him what she had photographed. And he went through and decided which ones it was called being impounded, which ones he did not want the media to see. So those were impounded um, during the war and shortly for a while afterwards. But it wasn't all the photos. There was a researcher who got that wrong, and it got on the Library of Congress site as incorrect. But it's been corrected since. Th they were happy to have the ones that looked nice. <laughs> You know, they they wanted to show, and this was Dorothea's assignment, show that we are doing a very nice, humane job of incarcerating the Japanese Americans. Uh, yeah, that was their goal. Um, but the one when she was able to sneak in a photograph that showed, like, say, a really long lunch line out in the hot sun that would get impounded by Major Beasley. And some of his choices were just weird. Um, but they are all available at the Library of Congress. If you go to the Library of Congress and say Dorothea Lange, um, Japanese American incarceration, you will get l all of her photographs you can see. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Please do feel free to raise your hand. And you can take your mask off when you Oh, yes, and please do take your mask off when you say a question. I just really want to, my name is Ann Muto. I used to volunteer at the museum years ago. Um, but I wanted to thank you for including the uh, Korematsu decision as part of the book. Mm -hmm. Because um, the books I had been reading up until that time, you had to go someplace else to find mm -hmm. that information. So it was like unlinked. Mm -hmm. And you did mm -hmm. a wonderful job linking it. And I really appreciate that. And thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, it was very important to me. Fred Korematsu, um, he was like, no, I didn't ask. I didn't, he did not uh, voluntarily go in and get incarcerated. And he took his case all the way to the Supreme Court saying this. And, and you know, he was able to say, like, no, 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 this is illegal what you are doing. I am a citizen of the United States. You cannot do this. Um, this violates our principles. Um, so it was a very important, um, very important case for civil rights. 
And actually, um, on that point, yeah. at, at the end of your book, you actually added a few uh, more descriptions, um, whether it be about after the war, what happened, why words matter, why do we use concentration camp, the term, mm -hmm. within, your novel, uh, within your book, citizenship violated, yeah. as well as the civil liberties and the constitution. And what I thought was also very interesting was the part about the uh, myth of the model minority as well. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your decision to add those parts to your book? Yes. So the afterword was really important to me because it, for a kid who wants to go deeper in and understand what's behind the storyline that's been set up, mm -hmm. um, you have to bring up what are those big issues that we're dealing with. Like, why is this a concentration camp? That is a very loaded word, pair mm -hmm. of words. Uh, but let's be real. These were concentration camps. They fit the definition of a concentration camp. So just to really be clear with people, like, no, I'm, I'm going to lay it on the page here for you. Um, at, Lauren and I were working so intensely together. At a certain point, she said, like, can we put in, like, a paragraph here about the model minority? Here, I wrote something up. And I'm like, actually, if we put it in the writing here, that would be... People would think that was me talking about the model minority. I'm not the person to say this. You are. Let's give you your own section in the afterword where you can explain the myth of the model minority and how devastating that is. And so she was like, oh, you want me to write like a whole spread? I'm like, yeah, yeah, go for it, Lauren. You can do it. So that's how great our process was mm -hmm. that she could go ahead and do that because that's something very dear to her heart. And she did a fabulous job with it. Now, this isn't so much a question as it's a statement about uh, the Miyataki uh, photo studio. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My family had a large reunion in Southern California on the Unamura side, <clears throat> and Alan Miyataki, the grandson, took the photo. <laughs> it, we had a group photo and several individuals, excellent photographer, and mm -hmm. among other things, and uh, we started talking about this book. And he was blown away that I had known uh, Betsy, as we called her, in school, since grade school. And so uh, that was a nice reunion in that regard. And Alan turned me on to a lot of other things, too. So it was, a, it was a nice meeting. But it's nice to see that the tradition of that studio is still going. Yes. And I can truthfully say he does very high-quality work. So. Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh, he's wonderful. He's been very <clears throat> helpful to us in putting this book together and very encouraging of everything we've done and like, yeah, you're doing great. Keep going. Anybody else would like to ask any questions? Um, this question might be weird. However, let me do that. Uh, what is the best way to tell your uh, thought to young generation. Uh, th these guys are Generation Z or Generation yeah. Alpha. They cannot understand your mm -hmm. message. Yes. Uh, I am uh, old enough to appreciate your book as well as your picture at the beginning. I cannot understand what is a picture of this. Uh, that is my first imp impression this morning. However, according to your explanation, mm -hmm. talk with your moderator there, gradually I understand. I, again, uh, I'm very much interested in to buy the book and to read a book and what is the content. However, again, how we can disseminate your a deep thought to any generation. Our generation, the generation Y, generation uh, X, we can maybe after uh, listening your message, we can appreciate, we can mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. become, we become uh, interested to read the one. But young generation, that is another mission yeah, this is a yes. This is a, uh, yeah. This is a very interesting question, right? How, 
Yes, how do we get a younger generation who has absolutely like, World War II must be like several light years in our past if you were born in this century, right? So how do we get them to um, fully feel what this experience was? Um, believe me, I grappled with that quite a bit. Um, my uh, hope is that for me, by combining photographs with this more graphic style, because mm -hmm. graphic novels are incredibly powerful and read these days by teenagers. So by getting this graphic style going within the book, I'm hoping that I can make that connection. Might I add a little bit here too? Um, and to give some context, the person who just asked the question is actually my father. And <laughs> I did notice he just said moderator and not Yuki, uh, my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that I did, that I did, and of course he must uh, challenge that. And so, of course, I will um, challenge you back, Father. <laughs> when I read this book, before I reading this book, actually, mm -hmm. I was really beginning to question, like, is this a heavy topic for children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this age appropriate? How do we talk about this in a way that anybody can understand of any age? And then I realized when I, I came to this picture that why am I questioning this when the people, the, the, pe the survivors were children themselves? If we were willing to do that, to children, and yet now, generations later, we're saying, well, now this is too much to talk about. There is something fundamentally wrong. We must continue to not be afraid to talk about this. We must continue to expose, to show the seen and the unseen, to talk about that. And what gave me so much hope is that now I feel like we have something to begin that process. This book is absolutely beautiful. And if I had this when I was younger, and I know I have a younger sister who is 10 years younger than me as well, I know that she is so much more of an activist than I am. Mm -hmm. And this generation, the younger generation, they each one has incredible, incredible messages to share, incredible thought to share. And so this book, will only help to nurture that, will only help to empower those voices. I truly believe that. Well, well said. Yes. That is the whole purpose of this museum. Exactly. For us to tell our story. And that's why Shirley and Bob and I, who were actually in the camps, but only children, are here talking about this. Yes. Because mm -hmm. we want to share that story. And young children come and listen to us. And like once a little boy said, can I give you a hug? Oh. <laughs> and so we do reach them yeah. because we have our museum, right, Shirley? Yeah. Never, ever underestimate <laughs> the power of these young voices as well and just how much they are already yeah. imbibing. Yeah. Now, you know, this is, su I mean, this is such an interesting topic because we're in such a... Um, transitional time of being more honest with children than we used to be. And, and we need to be because our children are entering a very <clears throat> difficult uh, world that they're going to have to navigate. So we need them to be prepared with information. Um, this is a, a spread from the book where you see Toyo working and you see a couple of the photographs he took. But some of what happened in Manzanar was not photographed. Mm -hmm. And there was an uprising in Manzanar, and there are no photographs of it. Toyo could not photograph, it was dark. And so I'm hoping a teenager will see this and be like, wow, what was going on? And then shots were fired during 
during this uprising. And we had to make a decision what to do. And I wrote this out and left blank pages here when I showed the photo spreads to my editor before we had um, the illustrations going. And she said, oh, oh we, can't, we can't do this part. This is too heavy. This is really heavy where this guy is slowly dying from being shot. There was no antibiotics. There was no support. And I was like, we have to do this section. We can't leave out this harsh truth. This is a way for kids to get this. And um, that, that's what Lauren was able to do. And through a beautiful oral history, um, uh, there, there was um, Paul um, Takaki was taking care of him and just felt absolutely helpless sitting next to him. And so I had what Paul said, Jim said, I don't want to die, Jim whispered. I don't want to die. Well, when you can throw a quote like that into a book for teenagers who are feeling immortal still, they're going to be able to like feel this very deeply, I believe. So I hope I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You certainly are. I'm, we have time for one last question. If anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Go ahead. This is really more of a comment than anything, but Betsy, thank you so yeah. much for sharing this <laughs> wonderful book with us. Thank you know, it's, you. It's, it's funny, and, and Yuki mentioned this earlier, right? This museum is a facility for these kinds of conversations. And you can go through the museum by yourself and you get one experience. But what you've done today is you've opened up a whole new story for everybody here because your book is one thing but when you've shared what you've shared today we're getting the unseen part of it and the museum is the same way I invite everybody to come view the museum but get a docent to give you a guided tour because that is the unseen part that you will not grab when you just walk through by yourself and just read all the text and it's the same thing about your book so again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna grab the floor for one more second. Of course, before, please do. <laughs> before, <laughs> before they say, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the great things about the incarceration is people are still telling stories that haven't been told yet. Mm -hmm. um, this is an amazing book by David Mas Masumoto. Uh, he's a peach farmer here in California. You may be buying his peaches at your local farmer's market. Mas Masamoto. Yep, I can see you getting geared up so you can take a photo of that. <laughs> Go for it. Um, this is an amazing book because he not only, he talks about his sister who had brain damage, who there was no way to care for her in the camp, and she was put into a facility and never spoken about until much later he found out about her shortly before she died and established a relationship with her. Intense, beautiful book um, with illustrations by Patty Wakita. Um, for those kids who are younger, this is a wonderful book, Love in the Library. This is written by Maggie Takuda Hall. Um, just come out recently. Um, it's about how her grandfather and grandmother fell in love with a love of books together. Um, and a special shout out. This is a beautiful handmade book called Benign Neglect. During the war, many of the beautiful, beautiful bonsai were neglected, abandoned, but, you know, survived, but barely. And Takishi Moro, are you here, Takishi? There's Takishi. <laughs> Takishi photographed all of these beautiful bonsai that have been restored. And um, this book is available. Um, I ha a, a friend gave me this as a gift, and I have it where I can see it, and I give myself a new bonsai to look at every day as a sort of meditation moment 
before I start my day. So wonderful things are still happening from the incarceration and truths are still being told in many ways that I've, I find very, very exciting. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for your time today and for coming all the way from, I believe you were in Berkeley? Berkeley. Yeah. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I know it was quite the drive for you this morning, but thank you. <laughs> and thank you to everyone here for joining us as well. Now, Elizabeth will be signing copies of these books. So please, I know that um, I'm going to just call all of you out. 95% of this room is probably does not have their holiday gifts yet prepared. <laughs> and this makes a perfect <laughs> gift. So I encourage you to buy not just one, but two and three and more and get all of them signed today. And um, I also want to share that the museum is now open and all of you are invited and welcomed to come and see our exhibits. And we have with here, uh, here with us Yoshiko and Shirley. If you could just quickly raise your hand here, um, our wonderful docents and who were both in the camps, they will be stationed in the galleries to share their stories and answer any questions that you may have. And of course, yes, Robert, thank you. Other docents will also be offering tours of the galleries as well, and if you'd like to join them. Masks are recommended, but not required downstairs. Now, I know today with your book, Seen and Unseen, you have asked us and challenged us to look not just at what we're seeing, but to think deeper, to look about what are we seeing here, but what are we potentially not seeing here? And so I encourage you today, when you're going through the museum, really think about that, interrogate, challenge, and to question, and return as well, because every single time you come back here, you will learn something new. Finally, if you'd like to find out about Commonwealth Club programs and learn more about creating citizens, please visit commonwealthclub-club-dot Dot org and sorry and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Links to the recordings of today's program will also be on the club's website. My name is Yuki Nishimura, and this concludes our program. Please enjoy your time at the museum and have a most beautiful weekend. Oh, I gotta get one more word oh. in. Wait, <laughs> sorry, sorry, you guys. One more amazing thing. Have some of you seen the incredible Japanese-American memorial to the incarceration in front of City Hall done by Ruth Asawa? Yes. I, I encourage all of you to please, you must be local enough to go see it. I don't know why people don't just flock to this incredible bronze memorial that's in front of City Hall. One whole side is the before life of how people were living their life, and the other side is being incarcerated, ending with the steps of the Supreme Court and Fred Korematsu. So please, go admire it and enjoy it. It's a, a spectacular piece of artwork. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay.